This podcast contains adult themes and language. The views expressed here are our own opinions and experiences. We are not medical professionals. In this podcast, we discuss our opinions about mental health, sobriety, addiction, and our pursuit of happiness and peace. This is Sober Mind. Oh yeah, <laughs> we're good. Yeah, we're good. Yay! Good morning. No issues. Good morning, all. Odie, always first, man. Fem, good morning. Nice to see you, Amanda. Good Welcome. morning. Welcome. Good morning, all. Good morning. All right, let's do introductions. My name is John. I'm Judy. And I'm Patrick. 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 <laughs> so my son says it. <laughs> All right, this is Sober Mind, where we have grown folk conversations about uh, honest, undiluted, unfiltered discussions about mental health and our sobriety journeys. Mm -hmm. Uh, Odie, okay, I can't read the chats. Very (laughs) distracting all the time. Oh, the pants. He likes. uh, I'm in. I'm in jammies because I got a bolt after this. Yeah, doing uh, Christmas activities with. uh, my dad's side of the family. So they have a pajama party. Pajama party. Which is fantastic. And I think everybody I think everybody who does who does Christmas should have it should stay in their jammies all day. I think that should be a requirement. Yeah. Everybody stay in your jammies all day. Yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, both my wife and I's families are split. And when we got the little ones, like I don't know if anybody's come from that. This is kind of a first world problem saying, but it was a a carousel of events on the holidays and it was really stressful during Christmas to be just running from place to place and so we talked and she was very well I'll be honest it was a lot of my wife's you know persistence and direction that like I think once we had our second like uh, we were pretty much like yeah we're done traveling on Christmas (laughs) if you want we will do whatever you know kind of the weeks leading up but like christmas day is for family and for Mm -hmm. enjoying that so we cook a big breakfast smorgasbord and invite people over and just say like look we get it if you can't come over our house is an open house but we're gonna spend our day in jammies and yeah and enjoying you know the family so nice we're very active outside of that but you know i think that you know, we were we were wanting to be protective of that space. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's good for your kids too. Okay. Hey Lisa, good morning. All right. What's up, y'all? <laughs> All right. Uh so today's topic before we do gratitude is uh addiction from the other side of the table. So one of our, our viewers and uh great supporters, Odie, brought this up uh a couple shows ago when we asked for fans or viewers to give suggestions and this was his it's a fantastic discussion we've discussed it in a in a roundabout manner many times yeah but it'll be nice to take a deep dive into it so before we get started let's go gratitude i'm i'm very grateful this morning about my my happiness and health i've lately been 
consistently in a very nice, positive, uh, almost serene mood, which, mm -hmm. you know, for us, oh man, I told myself I wasn't going to say, you know, to say, you know, a lot. <laughs> I was watching the videos for us folks that are cons have been anxious and high functioning, depressed for a, the greater part of our lives. Being happy consistently feels really nice. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know. In the last few months, I haven't had any drastic swings. So I think this is the continuation of me still. You know, it was just April when I got off all of the the medication. So it feels good. Yeah, you've been doing Great. really well. I will pay you the five bucks after the show for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm proud of you, John. Thank you. And also gratitude for you guys and the show. Thanks for being in, in my life and supportive. And thank you for all the uh, folks that are joining. Hey, Aster. Welcome to the show. Okay. Gratitude. Who's next? Uh, I'll go. Go. Uh, I am grateful for... Um... Okay, so recently I've been taking uh, different types of vitamins and nutrients and minerals and stuff like that. And I think I've gotten a really good combination to where I feel really good. Going through all of the hormonal crap that I'm going through to get something that, that keeps me happy and at an even keel throughout the day has just been fantastic. Um, it's all natural. It's all, you know, magnesium and uh, amino acids and ginkgo biloba and ginseng. And, and it's 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 all natural stuff. It's not anything that's prescribed or anything like that. But I've been able to get to a combination of stuff that has been working fantastic. And I haven't been on the emotional roller coaster that I have been on, which has been amazing. So that's I'm great. very grateful for that. Yeah. Experimenting with new tropics is a... Uh... Your mileage will vary greatly. Yes. yes. And your doctor can't really give you any advice because none of that is <laughs> so, FDA approved. You know, uh, amino acids. Damn, I said it again. Amino acids, uh, stuff like that. Anyway. That's right. I say right and like. You're a valley a girl. Lot. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a valley girl at heart. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. <laughs> now I'm not going to be able to do it with a straight face. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Uh, what are you grateful Patrick? for? Gratitude for me is uh, my sobriety directly, meaning um, I often frequent the stop drinking subreddit, you know, and help uh, give feedback and, you know, just participate in that community because that was critical for me early and getting a lot of um, resources and we often talk about growing your little tree of, you know, toolkits and mental health awareness. And in those early days, you're very, it's very nerve wracking because you got a little seedling and little, you know, you got to, it feels like you got to be super protective of it. And I'm at the point now, you know, a, a little over three years where I feel like it's becoming stout and robust, like it is the bastion of my, um, empowerment i don't know if that makes sense like it it feels like a, a rock within my identity almost now you've got a good foundation where i got a good foundation in it you know you know before without that i've with as tempestuous as life can be in the emotional roller coaster it it feels like a i don't want to call it like a fortress of solitude because i don't want to make it sound like i'm um retreating to it but it is my place of you know security and you know gives me the the footing to to weather those storms nice as they come good deal yeah that's important patrick that's a that's that's a good milestone to it's difficult to articulate does that to someone else because mm -hmm. you, how we always talk about your mileage will vary Mm -hmm. Depending on, like us, we're in our 50s. We drank for the greater part of 30 years very heavily. So our sobriety and mental health journey is going to look a lot different yeah. than a person that has been 
got into it knee deep for five years out of college and then it's like i i need to quit so that in different stages you know remember yeah. the first year like the first toolkits you're like i just i just want to like not drink so you're you know worried about going around events that have alcohol or events that would trigger you and stuff mm -hmm. like that now i feel like i can go to those and i can say when something does come up i, I can say at least i'm not you know, I don't have to either participate in part of that or like I'm happy not to because I have my sobriety. Like before I thought it was something that I needed to protect and now it's something that I can either wear on my sleeve or, you know, like that is something that continually makes me stronger. Good. Now, do you feel like you're more comfortable within yourself in those situations? Oh, now? absolutely. That's part of the journey, right? Yeah. Learning yeah. to be comfortable with what makes you uncomfortable. Yeah. I've noticed a difference in you in the over a year that I've known you as well. You've gone through, just like us all, some ups and downs, valleys and peaks. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for not just bailing out. Thanks for being here. <laughs> I wanted to say a couple things. Uh, one is, uh, good morning, mom. Uh, the second one is, um, Lisa said that um, we can do a whole show on hormones and recovery. Amen, sister. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Okay, let's get into it. You ready? Uh, Patrick has a hard stop at the top of the hour. So yep. if we're still, if we're into something good, you can just get up and get the fuck out. Okay, thanks, bye. <laughs> okay, bye. I am, just ghost out the, the side. You got the clock there, so. So okay. uh, today we're talking about um, dealing with uh, somebody else who, a family member, a family member, a friend, somebody else who is an addict, and you being a part of that relationship. Yeah. I think your sister brought up, um, you know, as we're getting into it, I really like those three fundamental items for the rules of engagement. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, we're going to talk about all other dynamics of that aspect, but I think those are the th one of the three most important things. They're simple and fundamental on engaging those with addiction. Yes, yes. My sister called me. She's she's uh, an Al-Anon member, and she's had to deal with these things, so she had some really good pointers today. The first one was... Um, to separate the person from the disease because it is a disease. And so we need to, uh, when dealing with that, is to learn how to separate the person from the disease that they have, which is not an easy thing because no. it's, it's society as a whole tends to put labels on things. And when they see somebody, we talked about this the other mm -hmm. last Saturday, when they see somebody with who is a, an alcoholic or a drug addict or something, that, that's automatically a label that's been put on that person. That that's out. It encompasses them as that's who they are and that's all that they are. And it's definitely not like that. Like they're in their position because they made bad decisions yeah. or because yeah. they're morally inept. Yes, right? there's something broken in that person, and so that's why they were there the way they are. When yeah. For the most part, with what I have been um, researching and doing YouTube and, you know, watching videos and stuff, it's not necessarily, there is something broken in that person, but it has to do with some kind of trauma yes. that that person experienced some time in their life that flung them into that situation and not going through that trauma and not having the tools to deal with the yep. trauma. And so they turn to alcohol or drugs or whatever. Yep. Yeah. I'd like to give a, a quick preface of how I want to approach this discussion. Sure. That is just to let everyone know that Judy and I are, we've been together for 22 years. 22 years, yeah. Dang, high five. <laughs> been married for 21 of those. Uh -huh. And for the greater part of that entire relationship, we we are codependent and we are both mm -hmm. alcoholics and c coupled with my depression and anxiety and judy was a heavy marijuana user as well i was a pothead so as we get into this discussion i, I think i'll be talking about my views 
from that side of the table because it's important for mm -hmm. uh, for uh, folks to understand that you can have that relationship it's not healthy but you can also come out on the other side of it like judy and i did mm -hmm. and then also give perspective on my childhood and middle adult or or uh, or, or post adolescent teen years of growing up with addicts and me of course being young and sober and how that affected me and hurt me emotionally mm -hmm. it's a lot to unpack we won't we will we might have to make a part two on this not have good thing this is a one. series of <laughs> discussion yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right so for this first seminar Pandora's box yep yeah so you, what do you want to do patrick you want to jump into it or how do you want to start yeah i mean i think as, as long as we're continuing with the rules of engagement i think we knocked those out so you know judy talked about the first one so the second one I think is extremely important because I think it's a global, um, it's it's a good golden rule, especially with addiction. This one's the super hard one. You wanna share the second? Uh, the second one was um, not to engage when they are either drunk or on drugs or whatever. When they are inebriated, that is not the time to engage them because they there is no filter on them. They will go full bore. They are not dealing with the person. You are dealing with the disease at that point. Yep. And that, uh, and I also want to bring up, uh, we'll get in later, but a lot of the issues that we begin to talk about with dealing with somebody of, with addiction also relate to codependency habits and behavioral mm -hmm. habits. And so while not engaging or trying to set extremely strict boundaries when the when that person is under the influence so too goes for you like don't try yeah. to engage um you know approach a subject when you are under the influence as mm -hmm. well either i think this is a i think this is a lot of where codependency mixes yep. into this yep. whole the whole uh batter of cake yeah. we're making here yep. um yeah because codependency is a is a heavy um it's another form. I, I think it's another form of a disease because you're, you are not coming at it from an educated uh, perspective. You're coming at it from a, a sick perspective as, as they are as sick, if that makes sense. Yeah. I don't know if that, yeah. Because the codependent is still is dealing with their codependency. They're not dealing with anything from um, a learned point of view. Yeah. I think codependency is probably more a, an emotional development opportunity. They're trying to be the rescuer. They're trying well, to fix. They, th those behaviors, uh, addiction, codependency, evolve out of us just trying to deal with the world as we see it. Mm -hmm. If With the tools that we have. With the tools <laughs> that we have. I feel shitty. I drink this. I feel better for this immediate short term. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the brain builds behavior around that. You know, we've we've talked many times of, you know, dispelling that myth and how it's actually hurtful in the long run. But in the short term, remember, the brain wants to avoid that short term pain. Mm -hmm. So all these like even the codependency stuff, if I if I cry out loud and I make a big enough scene, somebody will come and fix my problems for me. Mm -hmm. Boom, problem fixed. Right. So these Squeaky behaviors, yeah, these behaviors get reinforced. And so the mind, you know, in the prediction modeling machine, it goes, I want to avoid short term pain. Mm -hmm. And it goes, if I know this happens, then this will happen and this will happen. It may not be perfect, but I know it will happen and I can predict it. So mm -hmm. I'm going to continue and engage in these behaviors. And that's where the reinforcement comes from. So to tie it back to kind of our or thing that's why the rules of engagement are there you know um especially i know aa has this rule like you know if you show yeah. up drunk you know they're gonna say like look we need to have you sober mm -hmm. for x amount of time um because it, it just gets really messy because the brain is misfiring at that point mm -hmm. and when you're on your substance of choice yeah. And you're so, like, like I said, you're dealing with the disease at that point. You're not dealing with yep. the person. Yep. So rule number three on the rules of engagement. Uh, reach out. There's tons of stuff out there. There is Al-Anon. If you're a church goer, there is the clergy. If, um, you know, you, you have other, um, 
denominations out there that you that you go to, th there's always going to be somebody out there going through the same thing you're going through. Yep. Uh, this I speak to as find your modality. Yeah. You know, doctor, psychiatrist, therapist, support group, church group, yeah, hobby group, whatever works, whatever it is. And this approaches, I think this is an important one because this is one of those things that begins to pry apart that codependency. If you're in a strictly isolated codependent relationship and you're trying to deal with somebody with addiction, mm -hmm. you're going to have that intermixed batter of mess of, of codependency items, you know, martyr yeah. and savior and everything, all that mixed into it. But when you have a support group that, that is an outlet to help, help you process mm -hmm. you know certain things because you are a person too in this um well michelle the, just made a good point she says there's a fine line between codependency and caregiving yes yeah. so that's that's a that's a good that's a that's a good point to make because you can get wrapped up into it and if and if you're not coming from a, a stable place to begin with yeah i mean that's hard i've seen a lot of in a in uh so we've talked about if you want to learn more about codependency roles, the drama triangle, give it a mm -hmm. Google's does a really good job at trying to uh, place the inner dynamic relationships between some of the people. I would, or go to our former show that we or, did on drama triangle <laughs> and watch fault. on sober mind. Yes. Um, I wanted, I wanted to point out Fem also said that veterans have um, other resources at their disposal yes. as well. So yep. Absolutely. I don't want to, I wanna, don't want to discount Modality. As well. Go, go find yeah. it. Don't just don't be alone with it. Yeah. Um, and to that point, um, I wanted to get at, uh, for the people seeking help for others with addiction, um, I am just going to set up a warning to make sure to, uh, I guess in AA, they call it keeping your side of the street clean first. Mm hmm Right. You're going to have to work on stuff for you, setting your boundaries and empowering yourself in order to help the other person. Meaning, if that person is struggling with addiction, you're not going to be able to put on the cape and fight that battle for them. Yeah. Like yep. you're not going to be able to say I'm going to I'm going to take it all out of the house. I'm going to do all, you know, like I'm going to have all these rules that you have to abide by. There's there's points where you do set boundaries of stuff and they break it, but at the same time, you're not going to win the battle yourself of their addiction. Those are doors that that person has to step through themselves. So if you think you're mm -hmm. going to be the rescuer and martyr yourself to like, will, will it to happen? This is the sucky part. That person with addiction will fail. Relapse is part of the recovery and it scales to certain amounts, right? They're going to struggle with it and have some missteps and you know, for the person that thinks that they can save the other person, you know, that's that's a very hard point too. you know, because they wear that failure mm -hmm. as well. When a lot of these tools, you know, with Al, Al Anon is setting boundaries and learning how to set a safe space for not only the person with addiction, but yourself. The yes. rules of engagement are a perfect one. Right. Mm -hmm. When that person is. In the throes of the addiction, you don't go in there and being like, well, we're going to get you better and, you yeah. know, whatever. L let's talk about it. And it's like, look, it's setting up a boundary and says, I want to help you. But at this point in your state of mind, you know, that is, you know, not able to do so. I can't tell if it's you or the addiction at this point. So please come to me when you're sober. And we yeah, can I, I think I think it's very important to give yourself leeway to say no. No is a complete sentence. Yes. No is okay when you're in that situation. And know that, man, what a what a lonely process to have to go through as well for codependent yeah. relationships like that, especially when one is sober. Next year, if it all works out, we'll all have Michelle here physically. She can she can really talk her her journey and of, guy. Yeah, yeah, for and, sure. Oh. Well, Michelle's Michelle in particular, her journey of codependency is probably the one of the most textbook that I've ever seen. Yeah. She went through it for a long time, mm. and, and talk about you know a saint a saint of patience. 
was a lonely existence for for a lot of that i can imagine yeah so, because you also you also end up trying to uh, protect that person by hiding a lot of stuff a lot of their acts mm, a lot of yeah that's another a one. lot of their um addictions and uh, activities and stuff you try to hide that to try and save that person from judgment from other people and yeah. you just you can't do that right uh, that's part of that savior thing and i think that's mm -hmm. why support groups are are important because you got to learn the process that you know there is a certain point to giving them space for grace but at the same time if you do that too much you become an enabler yes right yeah like you're just providing a better shield for them to to get to their addiction yeah mm -hmm. right let's uh yeah let's jump into the enabling portion so that's a go ahead yeah they're talking about the self-care is not selfish care uh just yes. real quick the analogy yes. of when when you're on the airplane and the masks drop you don't climb over the seat to go put it on another person first what do they ask you to do put it on yourself put it first, on yourself first then help somebody else and so too with al on right here first take care of mm -hmm. yourself first so you can help take care of others there was a story that that i saw on um it, it's a it's a youtube channel called recovery tree and there was a story about this um guy who is in recovery and and he's sober now but he said the best thing that his mom did for him was to tell him no. He wanted a pair of shoes and he had a coupon to go get a pair of shoes because he was sleeping on the street and his feet were cold. And his mom said no. And three months, two months later, he ended up going into recovery because he didn't he didn't have those pair of shoes. So it put him in a more uncomfortable situation. And basically he ended up going to recovery and it saved his life by his mom saying no. Yep. That reminds me of a, uh, I mean, a very simplified story, yeah, but I want to be tangential here about, uh, self-empowerment, uh, to be able to do that and awareness of that. Uh, the late Kobe Bryant, I remember talked about dealing with money and you know, when you reach, that's a rare thing to be young and get that sort of money. And you often see people like just, you know, like either vote, they don't, have the emotional financial wherewithal they just think oh here's this guy he's making a lot of money i'm gonna go to him hey kobe i'm a family member give me money mm -hmm. and his best advice was to the the people that in the, his same situation was don't give your family money find a reason to invest in them mm, that's a good one so that means like it <clears throat> if you're coming to me for money find it give me a reason to invest in you Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, so too with recovery, don't try and recover the person yourself, you know, provide the space to invest in them so they can get the tools themselves to recover in a, a, in a more one. healthy state. That is good. All right. I'm going to, can we switch gears a little bit and yes. talk about the enablement? Do yeah. It. I'm going to talk about enablement from me and Judy's perspective <laughs> and the unhealthy <laughs> real roller coaster of codependency that it was. And, so I, I, for the last six, seven, hell, 10 years, Judy and I, we, we wanted to, to get sober in various fashions, but we would never talk to each other about it. That's a unhealthy form of enablement because we were scared. Go ahead, Patrick. Did you ever get drunk because she got drunk? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, no, as in, oh, we're doing this together or as in like, she is drunk right now. I wasn't planning on drinking, but I can't fucking deal with this. So I'm getting drunk. I would do that when she would smoke pot because she would get super stoned. And then pot smokers know that once you shut down, once you get high, you're just like <laughs> marshmallowed down. It's like, well, now, now I don't have a, now I don't have a conscious don't discussion have platform engaging, or right? an engagement yeah. model in my relationship. So fuck it. I might as well just get drunk too. That that's a really good example, Patrick. So that roller coaster happened a thousand times mm -hmm. because there was a I wonder I wonder if I could figure out a way to get sober today. And then Judy would be Judy, be high. <laughs> Judy be hitting the pipe. The Diet kitchen. starts Monday. <laughs> I know. Leave yeah. me alone. Yeah. And it's like, well, how this this shit's never gonna work out. There's always mm -hmm. a then of sorry, this is not a blame thing. It's always that's the excuse of I can't help myself if she can't help herself either. And on the flip side of that, there'd be a lot of weekends to where 
we'd wake up, you know, the, we've talked about this, the super, super, super hungover. Mm. And then I'd figure out a way to start drinking again to make, to stop the hangover process. Like we talked about on the previous episode, how your body's trying to process all that crap. So getting drunk again felt better. And then she would be drinking water and I'm, I'd constantly find myself going, can I get you a beer? Can I get you a beer? Can I get you a beer? No, I'm just going to stick with water. And that, that was really offensive to me. It, mm -hmm. I, I, I tried to rationalize like you know what you're doing john don't because because you have a problem and you can't sit here sober for the day you're you're taking offense that she is finding a day to be sober in its very simplest form there was a a tangible relief like towards the later part of the day when i'd be like you know 18 beers into it and she'd finally crack open a beer i remember thinking oh thank god it was like a huge relief. So because it validated behavior. I guess so. I think it also, um, for, for us, I think it also kind of, I guess, felt like we would be on the same wavelength again. We'd be, we'd be, we'd both be in it together. Mm -hmm. Misery loves company. Yeah, misery loves company. Yeah. I think these are important aspects to talk about, um, for, you know, for those dealing with somebody in addiction is uh, getting behind the science of it, meaning like understanding the behavior and recognizing it when you when it appears. So mm -hmm. put some college in your knowledge on this. That's a good tool for, you know, people dealing with that. So that that is one in a codependent relationship. What I'm trying to highlight is I, I've been there as as an addict myself. I I remember politely bullying or just straight out bullying you know, people who weren't uh, partaking like me because I needed to be validated in my actions like you were talking about. And they were because the anxiety and paranoia are high at that point. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if they're not if they're not with me, they're against me type of mentality. Like, yeah, how, how dare she think herself better than me? Like we're or, in this fucking together. So you or, know. or possibly they would be judging me. Right for you know over consuming so if they over consumed that i won't get the judgment yep that was you know that, <laughs> that was always one of my rules about getting drunk you know the rule is find that guy or that person and just don't get as drunk the decoy right just don't find get a decoy at the as, as party them. yeah and just don't get a hammerism for those that don't know the decoy is the person getting the most hammered at the party and so as long as you're not as drunk as them like this is the mental calculation my said. Yeah. I was just finding a way the to fit more we booze tell in. Is, tell, tell ourselves. Eventually, with you flirt with that line, or you can't find that person, you are that person. You mm -hmm. are the decoy, and or like you're trying to minimize your behavior. You think you're behind a, a shroud, you know, being protected because there's somebody else out there grappling with it. You're not. You're just. You're no. still as big an asshole. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think. I think dealing with um, a loved one or um, a friend or someone who is an addict and is going through these issues, it's not an easy thing to do, especially if it's a loved one. Um, but you definitely may have to make sure that you that you can recognize those codependent tendencies in yourself. I think. Yeah, we have so a that you don't. It's yeah. not an easy thing to do. And we have a we have sort of a, a trail end to that, which is interesting to talk about. So uh, Odie asked, how did you guys begin to deal with this together? So deal, we never dealt with the alcoholism and addiction, Odie, but we... It was a feedback loop. It was a feedback loop. I didn't loop. want to deal mm -hmm. with it, so we delved, delved deeper for, into for it. For me, it was fear. That's the only, mm. that's the only th reason I never approached you with wanting to quit, even though I wanted to quit. Yeah, the, cal um, the calculus on that was weird. Uh, so I will tell yeah. the story again in case the newcomers haven't heard it. Uh, on August 30th, I have it tattooed. August 30th, 2021. <laughs> I, w I woke up with such a bad hangover again, cr literally crying in my pillow that I, I had to go to work and I was sitting in the office and I was just like, I feel so fucking horrible anymore. My spirit is getting crushed. My happiness is gone. It's just dwindled away. It's withered, you know, like a dried on the vine, dried on the vine or like you get a, a 
tooth pulled and the little nerve is just there like oh, I'm oh. Di- dying and withering away. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, so I, I did the calculus. I didn't realize it at the time, but it was I made an excuse. This is again, this is how an addict or an alcoholic behaves. I started to make an excuse on almost a, a, a lie, a deceitful tactic of how I could get myself to stop drinking and include Judy within that. <laughs> it, was the best, it was the best con I ever did on Judy. So I, I, I walked in. And I in. thank you for that. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> and I walked into the room and I was just, I was like, man, I... I want to I want to get healthier so I'm thinking about let, let's just drink on the weekends. Mm-hmm. Judy's like, "Yeah, let's do that. Let's drink on the weekends." I went back into the office and I I already knew how stupid that fucking sounded coming out of my mouth cuz there was no <laughs> such thing. I walked into the room without even skipping a beat and I said, "You realize if we do this, we're going to double down on the weekends. We will get fucking annihilated starting Friday night through fucking sunday night and i think i came up with okay well let's just let's just quit for a month yeah do a 30-day challenge i said okay yeah 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 let's do a 30-day challenge i went back (laughs) into the room and i something just hit me and it since i think since we just started since now we we had a a tiny little yeah, open the door. blossom yeah. of are we mm-hmm. are we talking about we're our planting fucking, the seed. our drinking problem that we're well aware of together? Are we talking about it now? So I went back in the room, half an hour later came back out and said, <laughs> I think I think we should just quit. Yeah. <laughs> I just have this image of my head. I love how you guys is I've said this before that your relationship has been strong enough, you know, like even in the darkest times you've always chosen each other. And I think that's a very special thing that you can continued to grow and foster even more so in sobriety and that's awesome i just imagine this like john being like you know the this door-to-door salesman and judy opening the door and he's like well, what if we just did the the weekends and then she's like well 30 days and it opens up just a crack and he just like brings the boot and he's like we're done forever we're doing this yeah. we're quitting oh my god the, okay so the level of fear that i felt when he said uh, okay well you know we should just quit yeah <gasps> i remember i was super excited you were very hesitant about oh that. man i was terrified okay but real yeah so then I walked back in the office, came back a half an hour later. I said, why the fuck did you not tell me? Did you Have you been wanting to do this? She's like, yeah, uh, really bad for the last couple of years. Because that's when we'd start to dabble into a lot of whiskey and, and cocktails oh, brown and stuff. Liquor. So oh, it just started God. to you know, get bad for the bodies. But I was like, I have been too. For how long? Like, well, at least seven years I've been wanting to. She's like, what the fuck? I'm like, yeah, well, here we are. So that's when we started reading journal books and everything. Man, that yep. first week was, it felt so damn good. For anyone out there quitting, especially alcohol, that after that first week of sobriety, man, you're just starting to get cleaned out and you're like, man, I'm sleeping good. But real quick, Patrick, the thing that was a struggle and the, the still the codependent portion of it was we were both white knuckling it uh, and Judy continued to smoke pot. Yeah, so, for, for two weeks after that, I was still smoking pot. And then then I just decided, because I didn't feel like I was still taking that full step and cutting, you know, not being a dependent on something. Mm-hmm. Um, so I about two weeks after we quit alcohol, I said, you know, I'm, I'm going to quit smoking pot. I, I don't feel like I'm 100% invested in this I was in so this relieved. Venture, so. I was so relieved because there, that's another... I was then kind of, I know it sounds dramatic because some people might say, well, it's just pot. It's not, if you guys don't know how Michelle and Judy consumed pot in your lives, probably <laughs> a good part of the half, the half, daily. Of, the, half of the, half of the global <laughs> the daily. import value volume. Of, so there was a lot of it and it was just, Judy would, would stay in a state of some sort of stoniness and it was tough to go through that sobriety. So I didn't know. It's a I'm, mushroom. I'm glad that she cracked and was like, I, I had it. Man, her she had some legit pot withdrawals for that first week too. Ooh, if people bad. think that, I'm, this is not an anti-marijuana thing. People, you know, we all know how it works and blah, blah, blah. But when you consume it to the extent that some people do, you're going to, the just extent like, that just I did. Like just co- say just it like, out. Just say yeah. it right out. I <laughs> was like, like well, on it. <laughs> Man, wicked headaches and fucking mood swings for that first week. But then it went but then she had the the awakening too. So it was it was really comforting. But I didn't know real quick to wrap up this portion of it. I didn't I was going through the sobriety and there was 
I had a little a little candle of resentment sit in there too. Like I'm sitting here sober and she's fucking stony. I think it didn't feel good. Didn't feel supportive. No. Well, I think I that was important though, because I th- we're bringing up an aspect of uh, either Al-Anon or dealing with an addict that mm-hmm. is very important. Is you know I don't own the actions of others. The best I can do is lead and model the way. That means that. You're going to you're going to be there standing, presenting solutions in spaces for these to get better in them. And they may not take it immediately. Mm -hmm. You may feel upset and dismissed. You may feel angry that, you know, I'm here trying to help you. I'm doing this and you're not doing it with me. The the act of giving the space is where the value is Mm -hmm. not whether or not the person walks through that door because they will walk through when they are ready. Mm -hmm. The best you can do is be there, you know, in a safe, healthy manner without compromising yourself. And when that person is ready to come through, I mean, I bet on the other side of that, you know, when she did put that down was, was probably a big relief, right? Mm -hmm. You know, because it's like, we're we're finally getting on the same page of what sobriety actually is. We're yeah, trying to get the journey. The journey. Mm-hmm. So I I think that's important that you know as dealing with somebody with addiction and why groups like Al Anon are important is you may have a revelation and say like oh I can give this to this person dealing with addiction and, and you know maybe a new thought or it's a new avenue for them to explore. And, and guess what? It may not work or they may not be on board with it and it may not sink in. And and that sucks. And it we just, have to we also have to realize that what is going to work for us is not going to work for someone else. Yep. Um, if you're you're you know, you have a loved one who's suffering and going through that. It's not it's not necessarily what you think would fix you should fix them because their their journey is going to be totally different than what your journey is going to be yeah this has given me again a lot that's why i love our show a lot to think about i don't know how i don't think i'm selfless enough to help someone else a, a family member or a friend i don't have any friends that are well, I don't that have could any have, friends. That period, could also have been from your previous experience when you were You're younger. helping me. But, well, thank you, Patrick. And and uh, to Judy's point too, you've had some your physically close people in your life. You've had some pretty traumatic relationships with, mm-hmm. right? So I mean, uh, I said before the show here, dealing with somebody with addiction is tough, but the the difficulty exponent exponentially increases as that person's proximity to you does so that means if the person is closer to you this is going to be so much more fucking harder oh yeah Yeah. like it becomes more difficult uh with family with you know dealing with a mom or a brother or whatever when you're sharing a household with that person man setting boundaries is absolutely and terribly difficult. I know, but, but very that, necessary. Yeah, but that's the, the fundamental part. So we've had we've had to set boundaries. It is it is tough. And like I I, yeah. I want to also acknowledge though that man, it is like I said at the beginning when I was talking about Michelle ex- exclusively. I went through this stuff when I was a kid. We've all been through it in various fashions. Mm-hmm. The lonely isolation and the kind of makes me teary. The sitting there watching your mom any loved one go through this while you're it just it just it's like a vapor of a relationship that just starts to wither away and that having that selfless just i don't know what to do about this situation that's mm-hmm. where when i was a kid i didn't have the the resources or the thought process to figure out how to talk to someone who was i supposed to talk to all of my family was knee deep in some form of addiction it's hurt and it's very hurtful to and, sit back and have to watch that because you don't have comfort and you disconnected and you know that's yeah. those your trauma that you had to deal with at some point i always i am a firm believer that um nearly everything that we have a relationship either physically or with a person like 
everything goes through a grieving process, mm-hmm. you know, through this, the stages. And whenever we get stuck in that, that is where either trauma or the difficulty or our behaviors, you know, not being able to, uh, what are the, the classic five? I forget anger, negotiating. Oh, the levels of grief. Yeah. Yeah. I, those I don't know are, them all. <laughs> well, those are the points of the process of dealing with it. And, you know, if denial. you're in a relation, denial, if you're at a, a certain point with, think, like, honestly, think about it, you know, uh, John, to use your example of your mom, like, you reached a certain point of that grieving process and you know you get stuck in multiple stages at once Mm -hmm. but there's core stages and then you just when trauma happens when you just say yeah nope i'm out Mm -hmm. and if you're if somebody's stuck in the denial phase right they're just going to do everything in their power to build that image up like that didn't happen that person's dead to me blah 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 like meaning i i never had a I never really cared about that person. You know, they'll do everything to say like, you know, to, to dead it, you know? Yeah. But in reality, they're hurting because they did have a relationship. Right. Mm -hmm. And it sucked and they didn't have any explanation or why it went away and it was out of their power. Or Or they internalized it. And and they they internalized it. Yeah. I've often said that trauma also exists when, because the child gets stuck or the person gets stuck in that grieving process, it's either something wrong is wrong with the world or mm-hmm. something ro- is wrong with me. Mm-hmm. And I deserve that. Yeah. That's the big one is that I deserve it. Th- well, you, stuff- it. And there's a lot of times that you take it on, like, like when you're a kid and your parents do something that, you know, is... Like my parents got divorced when I was five. So I instinctively thought it was, they were divorcing because of something I did. So, I mean, when you're a kid, you don't, you're not, your thought process is not developed to the point to where you can make those mm, knowledgeable decisions and learned decisions. You just, you know, react and. They just need the development space to grow their toolkit, to grow their tree. So too with the people for us with addiction and so too Mm -hmm. dealing with other people with addiction Mm -hmm. is learning to help set up. I'm not saying grow their garden for them, but you can help help them set that space. Mm -hmm. It's like putting putting those bumper rails on a on a bowling lane. Right. (laughs) You're not you're not actually throwing the ball for them. You're just putting up the bumper lanes to try and, you know, and that's sometimes setting hard boundaries, you know. Yeah. Hey, if you're going to talk to me. I need you sober or, you know, if, you know, if extreme situations, Hey, I can't trust you in my house, but I'd love to meet you in this public Mm -hmm. setting, Mm -hmm. you know, setting out proper rules of engagement is important on that to be able to provide that space for them and for yourself. Yeah, man. I'm so glad we're not in that anymore. Yes. I've been in those situations, Patrick, all of that stuff. I'm so, I'm so grateful that I, I don't, so if you're out there suffering with that, I'm, I feel super bad for you. That's a having to be in those relations. I think it's a thing we take, I take for granted probably anymore because we don't have to deal with any of that shit. Having a family member or a friend that's in the throes of all that. So yep. just a reminder, it's important to, yeah. to, to start talking about this, find a resource and reach yep. out. Definitely reach out. There's going to be, there's going to be someone at least, you know, more than one person who's going to go through, who's going through the same thing you're going through. Yeah. Um, Stories aren't going to be exactly the same, but you can find sympathy and perhaps another perspective of what you're dealing with yes. to, to begin to approach. Uh, I always like to say a diamond in order to see all of its facets and all its glory. You have to view it from multiple perspectives. Same too with the problems that we're dealing with. Learning to talk about it and and understand and sympathize and empathize with other people's issues may give you insight and reflection onto your own just Mm -hmm. because that how that works there's another point with dealing with addicts that i want to kind of like address the elephant in the room Mm -hmm. and it's a hard one and it's a hard lesson to learn because we have a lot of emotions wrapped up into this and i i'm just going to call this rule as don't con a con Mm -hmm. um if you try to approach with either manipulative or uh, transactional behavior with them, 
This is a person in a, because of the throes of addiction, addiction has us lie to ourselves on the daily. Mm-hmm. We are born in the crucible of a lie. Like we could paint a rosy picture for you and do all the nice words and everything, mm-hmm. but behaviors is really what predicts or, you know, um, for a lot of addicts, words are wind. It's their behaviors that you have to pay attention to. And uh, this is just goes put to understanding. When I said put some college in your knowledge a little earlier, that means just like understanding how behaviors work in the person and, and seeing that red flag. You know, they can promise you the world ups. You know, I'm going to get better. I'm going to get better. I'm going to get better. You don't need to worry about if they're getting better or not. You need to only worry about if you're able to healthily engage in providing that space that I talked about that is not hurtful to you, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's a really hard one to tease apart and that's where these support communities come in because you have, these are the rules of engagement that you have to learn to provide that space in a healthy way. Cause that's where, you know, the, the person's hurting themselves with their own lies. And if you buy in on that, you know, of course you're going to get hurt. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and it's not easy to separate, you know, or to navigate that very easy because emotions cloud our judgment. And And the first thing you want to do is help that person. Yeah. And unfortunately, some things that you need to do to help that person are not going to be comfortable. Yep. So imagine what, what Judy and I, and and we're not, are you, are our situation and relationship is not unique. There's millions of these out there, but imagine the confusion that our soul is going through while we're drunk. We know that we need to get sober. And on the flip side, I want to help Judy with hers and she wants to help me. <coughs> mm-hmm. That's tough. It's a, uh, it's very, we're, I know we can't, we're just talking about it for an hour here, but this shit is a really complex. There's a lot more to it, but I, just like we always try to do, I think we want to be good shepherds of getting the discussions primed and let people know that if you're suffering through that stuff, just start to talk about it. Get it get it out there. Yeah, I think one of the things that helped us was that we had each other to go through this with. We weren't going through it solo. Yeah, that is like kudos to Michelle. I, I don't, man, I don't know if I could do that. I just don't. It'd be so, so fucking difficult. I've seen the relationships. I've heard about it. Someone living in that coded, I don't, man, tough. Yeah. I, I don't know how Very hurtful. relationships, um, how any, how our relationship to be perfectly honest, I don't know how our relationship would have lasted if one of, or the other, decided to quit drinking and the other one didn't oh i i couldn't possibly imagine how you would deal with me with the level of fucking drunk you know because i couldn't moderate it <laughs> like judy pick me up another fucking case while you're oh i take advantage of the situation if you're always sober drive me to the bar no <laughs> but so thank you for i'm just kidding i'm not that bad but yeah and then vi- vice versa too and i think that's why we were afraid I th- that yeah we had that discussion in the past too of like wow because i didn't i knew that i was not strong enough to um go sober alone and to have it constantly around me i i just didn't i didn't think i was going to be able to do it yeah what a fantastic, sad discussion. <laughs> yeah, I think it's important, too, to... Yeah. I mean, it is sad because, um, you know, I've seen many times when people trying to save other people from addiction that they get stuck in that pit, too. Mm-hmm. And The our, constant worry, the constant, um, you know, broken heart, broken promises... Yeah. Or even turning to the addiction itself for relief. You know, yeah. this is w- when we yeah. talk about breaking the cycle. You think children of alcoholics choose to be alcoholics? I don't think so. I think they just don't have the coping mechanisms and the tools to they deal with it. That. They and, were and never that was taught in their, that. That was in their environment all the time. Right. So, too, you know, I think that's the importance of you know, stuff like Al-Anon and learning codependent behaviors, you know, growing your garden and learning how to give self-care first. Mm -hmm. It's funny that that is the same toolkit that we preach for those in addiction, Yeah, right? Learning to to grow 
self-care first and the toolkit interior. Same thing for those dealing with somebody else that has addiction. Yeah, and you're both you're both dealing or trying to deal with that specific disease, whether you are in it or whether you're a bystander, you're still trying to deal with that specific disease. Yep. We're just trying to deal with being people in general. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we are we are a fucking nuisance, us people. But you know, it's really it's it's one thing I gotta say. You can always walk out the door. Yeah. Well, man, fuck great discussion going on. And see, Lisa said uh, another meatball of pain. Lisa, yeah. <laughs> did you tell Lisa that you read the meatball of pain when she was not on the show? The sh she didn't have a chance to watch that day. Well, you know, perhaps that we may have another chance to have. Yeah. yeah. When can we have read? Was, when can great, we talk that about that? Poem. Is that still secret? We can't announce it yet. Not yet. I, There's nothing I to announce know. at the moment. Oh, all right. Well, yeah. This person has to tell us when. And you can see him just vibrating. Yeah. I don't want him to say in, in January, we, we might have a special guest, but I don't know if it's been confirmed yet or not. We're, I would say like 90%. 90%. Okay, oh, cool. All right. Uh, Patrick has got to get out of here in uh, six minutes. So let's start to wrap it up. Uh, man, great, great discussion. Yes. I cannot believe we're, we're staring down the barrel of Christmas week. So ne yeah. next Saturday... Patrick may uh, be preoccupied with another uh, family affairs, family affairs. <laughs> so whether he is here or not, we still are planning on having the show. We're going to talk about cravings, especially around this time of the year. And there's, yes. a, there's a lot that I want to talk about. It's the the constant cycle of, of stuff. Actually, mine have really withered down but well, it's really itchy and it's not just just because of the bad christmas sweaters yeah yeah <laughs> yep. cravings cravings get itchy those of us that are former nicotine addicts will tell you patrick mm. you were never there man but oh, i gave up uh i used to chew and oh you did smoke. oh you did i didn't know that oh yeah well, so you know, you know i Copenhagen? we were like what 20 no about 50, 20 years so uh, out of quit smoking cigarettes uh, yeah I quit in 99. You quit in about 2002. Man, she's talk about the stink. She was smoking still. While Man. We're I was like, good God. That's I, don't one I still habit. get cravings <laughs> every I, once in a while. So yep. do I. And it got. I mean, they're they're like that. They're, they're gone within a second. They would always still. appear too when I drink. And like if I'd get too drunk, I'd always have to like. Um, and I had this line from my roommate in college. I remember him, you know, we're like 19. And he's like, man, Drinking without smoking's like pooping without peeing. <laughs> <laughs> and like whenever I, I mean, it, even after I quit smoking, if I, when I, whenever I drink, like I can tell you that itch was really strong always. Yep. Oh yeah. Nicotine is a beast, man. But fuck, it makes me feel so good. <laughs> Michelle says, you bet, Jeff. <laughs> yep. All right, uh, Patrick, today you, you have to promise me, I know you're a fan of the dad jokes, so... I think, I think Beckett and Flynn will really appreciate this one. It's a thinker though. Okay. Whether, whether, when you're leaving today, when you put your vehicle in reverse, you're going to have to pause for a minute and tell them both, man, this really takes me back. Yeah. <laughs> Patrick. Nailed it. Patrick, Nailed you want to hear my duck call? Oh no. All right, here goes. <clears throat> Come here, duck. <laughs> If I, you know, if I say those, my son's going to have those on repeat for the next like few oh, weeks. Yeah. Good. And then I hear it from my wife about how those jokes are so bad. And I'm like, well, he's just, he's just workshopping it. Well, oh, we Odie would... saw the short. I did that on the short. <laughs> um, we want to thank everybody for, um, for tuning in and listening. And, uh, we, we would greatly appreciate it if you jumped onto YouTube and, uh, Hit that little subscribe button. Um, what's what's the YouTube channel, babe? Sorry. <laughs> See, that, the, the duck one will get you. It's in the delivery, though. It's uh, YouTube.com forward slash at Sober Mind. Yeah, I don't want to show the graphic like a lot of folks do, but thanks for all the support that we're getting. But a staggering like 79% of our viewers are not subscribed. It will really help the channel if you could like, like and subscribe. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> trying to punch myself in the face <laughs> thanks everyone um, if you um, 
have anybody or know anybody or you yourself are trying to um, get sober or seek help, reach out to Al-Anon, reach out to, to your your church group, re- reach out. You will you will find some help. If it's something you want to talk about, drop a line in the chat. If, yeah, if there's a definitely. topic that you want us to 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 work through and navigate and chime in or maybe get a different perspective on, we're not gonna put on the capes and save the day, but per- perhaps it provides another perspective to think on. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Absolutely. And uh thank you, Odie. Speaking of Odie, also go out there and support his channel. He's a great supporter of the show. Him and his his uh his clan of folks that he's brought over. ODN7 on Twitch. I I jumped on the chat the other day and I donated just because I wanted to hear him mention my name on the chat. It felt good. <laughs> I need to get him to. <laughs> by the way, by the way, he actually can become downstairs to listen to it. <laughs> I need to get him to do like a little uh, sound blurb of uh, Destiny's Child of say my name, say my name, say my name. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. All right, y'all. Have Thank a you. fantastic week. Have, Have a good a fantastic... holiday. You are loved. Be kind to yourselves. Be patient with yourself. And we'll talk to you next weekend. Bye. <laughs>